What's up guys, Donnie B here. I've been a Samsung Galaxy user since the S4 back in 2013. Coming from the iPhone 4, I was blown away by the amount of settings and customization that you could do. Even back then, I have systematically upgraded at least every two years. In the early days, it was usually every year because the technology was moving so fast. Storage was doubling every year. Chip sets were getting smaller and faster and more efficient. Battery life just gets longer and longer. I even bought this ridiculous S4 Zoom. It's basically a S4 with a point and shoot camera on the back of it. Needs to say, I'm a fan. But nowadays with devices costing a thousand, fifteen hundred, even as much as $2,000, is it even worth upgrading your phone as often? This is the S23 Ultra. It's the latest flagship from Samsung and by nature, it is an absolute beast. The cameras are incredible. The display is the best I've ever seen and I still cannot get over how long this battery lasts. But do you need it? Is it worth upgrading from a two year old device? That's what we're gonna find out today. First, we're gonna go over the specs, any new features, cameras, and so on, and then we're gonna compare it with the S21 Ultra. Also, my wife filmed a lot of the B-roll in this video. So if you would, go ahead and hit that like button for her so that I can get her to do it again. She really was a big help, and she's not into this stuff at all. So just please take a second, hit that like button. I promise you'll see it, and maybe even consider coming aboard full-time. So immediately the first thing you notice is how thin these boxes are getting. I'm all about saving the planet, but the first thing that comes to mind is what are we not getting in the box this time? Fortunately, we still get the USB-C to C cable, a little bit of paperwork, and a SIM ejector tool. They used to include a USB-A to C adapter, but I guess at this point everyone has a USB-C. Even Apple was forced to join that party. In the hand, it feels much larger, but I think this is due to the flatter sides rather than the roll off like the previous models. The screen real estate is still 6.8 inches and the overall size of the device is 3.1 inches wide, 6.4 inches tall, and just under half an inch thick. This year, the front and back are covered with Gorilla Glass Victus 2. And with my experience with Gorilla Glass Victus, I expect this to be extremely tough. Regardless of how tough it is though, I always use a white stone dome screen protector since they work perfectly with the ultrasonic fingerprint reader. And be sure to subscribe so you don't miss how to install the white stone dome. It can be a bit tricky if it's your first time doing it. Uh, this is Samsung's third generation of the ultrasonic fingerprint reader and it seems to be a lot faster and definitely more accurate. At the top of the display is the hole punch for the new 12 megapixel selfie camera. This is down from the previous 40 megapixel. Now I understand why they did this. For one, the low light performance has increased exponentially, but the portrait mode is insane. When you have less data coming in, then you have more room for processing performance. This is why so many cameras crop in 4K, and when you have less pixels, this doesn't necessarily mean the sensor is smaller. It means that the pixels are larger and more sensitive to light. I think it was a great call that Samsung made and it gives the processor more room to work with things like edge detection and auto exposure, but we'll talk a lot more about the cameras later when we get to the back of the phone. The sides are polished aluminum and pretty bare bones with no buttons or switches on the left. The right side has your volume rocker, power button, and what appears to be a 5G millimeter wave antenna. Comments I found on the internet are saying that this is only on the US version. One thing I do want to say before we move on, and maybe it's just me, but the power button seems to be a lot softer to press, like in an annoying way. I accidentally called 911 twice with the phone in my pocket because I had the SOS uh, setting turned on where the five presses of the power button will call 911 and send your location to anyone you choose to include in that setting. I've had this setting turned on for as long as I, I can remember it being an option. I think it was maybe the S10 and it has never been an issue until this phone. So maybe most people won't have a problem with it or even notice it, but it was something that I noticed right away. On the bottom, there is a USB-C port in the middle along with the SIM tray, microphone port, and the S Pen. The stereo speaker grill is also there, but they put it in kind of a tough spot. The sound that comes out of the S23 is impressive, but when you turn the phone to landscape to watch a video the way videos were meant to be watched, 
your hand covers the speaker grill. So I find myself more often than not holding it with like my fingertips. And maybe it's not a big deal for most people and maybe I'm just being picky, but it's just kind of a uncomfortable way to hold it for a long time. The S Pen. I really thought this was going to be more gimmicky than useful. And boy, was I wrong. I take a lot of notes, whether it's making a punch list for my cabinet work or video ideas and shopping lists. You can write notes directly to the lock screen and save them to your notes app or calendar without ever even unlocking the phone. That is so convenient. You can even turn on pen to text where your handwriting will convert to text. I found it a little aggravating or maybe it finds me a little aggravating because of my penmanship and the fact that I usually write in all capitals. It does know the difference and will translate exactly what you write, but you can even edit documents by like scratching out the words to delete it or uh, drawing an arrow in between words to add a word in between. There's also a magnifying glass that will enlarge whatever you hover over by up to 300%. And you can translate words, scroll through feeds, cut, copy, and paste, and the button on the pen itself is mappable. I have it set as a shutter button for a single press and to change the cameras with a double press, but it can be set to open apps or play and pause tracks or even use it as gestures. Before we get into the cameras, let's talk about what really makes this thing tick. Not much has changed from last year. It's still powered by the Snapdragon 8 Gen 2, but this year they're calling it the 8 Gen 2 4 Galaxy, which is basically just an overclock. Base storage is 256 gigs, but you can get as much as a terabyte. Just about every time I checked out Samsung.com or the shop app, they were offering double storage for no additional charge. It was usually something like buy 256 gigs and you get five gigs for free or 512 gigs for free. Memory is 12 gigs across the board and has an option to go as high as eight gigabytes of virtual RAM that they are calling RAM Plus and this takes from your storage. I honestly do not know if that's something worth doing or not. Maybe that is a test we should do in the future. And let me know in the comments if that's something that y'all would want to see. By default, this is turned on and set to eight gigabytes. The battery is a 5,000 milliamp hour and it is obviously made by some witches or wizards or something by how long it lasts. No kidding, after 14 hours of all day, first day at that, so you know that the screen was on a lot and taking photos and recording video. It was what I would call a heavy use day. I had 35% left. This is easily a two day battery for most people. Usually I would consider what I have turned on and how my brightness would be and what would I do to conserve battery, but not on this one. I even have location on all the time so that my routines and reminders will work whenever I leave and arrive at certain destinations. I'm still getting two days. It's absolutely incredible. Now let's get into the money makers. On the back, the minimalist design continues with the lack of a camera bump and you're greeted with five round lenses that house your cameras, laser autofocus and depth sensor. It's funny how things come back around full circle now that the cameras look like they used to with just a single lens for the camera rather than like a huge camera bump. This is how the S series looked when it started. The cameras consist of a 12 megapixel ultra wide with a 2.2 aperture and a 13 millimeter full frame equivalent, a 200 megapixel main camera, which is actually a 12 and a half megapixel that can be bent 16 to one to create 200 megapixels or four to one to create 50 megapixels. If you choose either of the higher megapixel options, then any of your zooming will have to be done by cropping um, since you do not have the option to zoom in camera, which isn't bad. The information is there and to be able to retain the detail as long as you don't go overboard with the cropping. But for most of us, the 12 and a half megapixels is more than enough. And honestly, I prefer to zoom in before the shot rather than crop in afterwards. Then you have the telephotos. There is a 10 megapixel F 2.4 three times telephoto and a 10 megapixel f 4.9 10 times telephoto periscope lens with a full frame equivalent of 230 millimeters and as long as nearly 700 millimeters. For a lot of shots, this 100 times zoom is unusable, but depending on what it is, AI steps in and does a lot of the post-processing magic on it. 
For example, this is a 100 times zoom on a hawk that I've been watching around the house, and it looks horrible, I'm not gonna lie, but I mean, you can tell what it is, but you would never try to post this or share with your friends. And then this is a photo with the same 100 times zoom of a building across the river from where I was standing, and it looks perfectly fine because of the AI being able to see that it was mostly solid colors and sharpening and denoising would correct the image. I do want to talk about the portrait mode before we move on to video. And let me start by saying this, Samsung's portrait mode is literally what got me into photography. I've told this story several times, but I bought the S10 and I took a picture of my daughter and was blown away by the results. This led me to buying moment lenses and filters and then getting a DSLR and now I'm shooting mirrorless and own a dozen lenses and an entire room full of gear. It is incredible how well this portrait mode works. The amount of blur in the background looks so natural. The separation of the subject and the, the line defining it, uh, the, identif the identifying of a subject, it all just works so well. And Samsung does a great job of keeping the colors natural and not oversaturating the image. It's just a very pleasing result. And when you open the camera app for the first time, it asks you if you want natural or warm skin tone. So I guess it's just preference, but the natural looks great. I have not tried the warm tone, but Samsung usually is a little on the warm side, while Apple has always been on the cooler side. So I figured it'd be nice to try something different. One of the biggest improvements has got to be in the video department. Those of you that have been around for a while probably remember any time I would film with my phone, the first thing I would do was apologize for the quality. Well, not anymore. The colors are amazing and you still have the usual frame rates and resolutions, but stabilization has risen to a whole new level. So much so that I can finally say that they are in the same ballpark as Apple. I will admit that Apple has always had the lead on mobile video for as long as I can remember. But for the first time, Samsung is finally a contender. I mean, just look at this comparison between the S23 Ultra and the S21 Ultra. It literally makes the 21 look unusable. All right, so now that we've seen what it is and what it does, and you already have a device that's say two years old, should you get it? Well, if you're the type of person that just enjoys having the latest and greatest, then yes, for sure. What are you waiting for? If you're looking for someone to tell you that it's okay, then yes, it's me. I'm saying you will love this device. If you take a lot of photos or create content with your phone, then for sure you will appreciate it. But if you don't really care about all that, then I, I don't really see a reason for you to get this device. I will say that honestly, the user experience is exactly the same between the S21 Ultra and the S23 Ultra. They're both running the same version of Android. They're both on the same version of One UI and the look and feel of navigating around are identical. But you need to consider upgrading the following year because you will no longer be getting Android updates and depending on who your service provider is, then your security updates may not be far behind. This is actually the first time that I'll be trading in a device to get a new one. I've held on to all of my old phones until now. It's kind of sad to see her go. You know, this is the first one that I actually ordered directly from Samsung and not Verizon. I even got the online exclusive color that I had to wait an extra like three weeks for. Anyway, sometimes you just have to take a picture of it and say you had it. All right, well, that's gonna do it for this one. I hope you found it helpful. And don't forget to hit the like button for my wife shooting all that B-roll. We really need her support on the channel just as much as we need yours. So be sure to subscribe if you haven't already and take care of yourselves. You know you deserve it. I'm Donnie B and we'll see you on the next one. Peace. Oh, 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 oh,